The Elder Scrolls is a quality franchise, but just as the gods of the Elder Scrolls have no idea what they're doing, gamers can't make up their minds about which game is the best. Which is why I set out to answer a question completely unrelated to everything I've said so far. Can you beat the Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion without taking any damage? When you can't take damage, the name of the game is Stealth. You want to stay as far away from whatever you're attacking as possible, which is why I went with a Wood Elf for my character. They start off with a higher sneak and marksman skills, perfect for the stealth archer I'm bringing to the party. Did you really think I was gonna be anything other than that? The guy across the way taunted me a bit, and the time had come to set my health to 1 so that any damage of any kind kills me. Unfortunately, this cannot be done as easily in Oblivion as it is in Skyrim or Fallout. The player.forceav command is the only one that actually did anything, and even then, it never set my max health to 1, it set my current health to 1, out of however many health points I had. So it was at 1 out of 81 at the beginning, and I couldn't figure out how to get that 81 to become 1. But it wasn't the end of the world. Checking every now and again to make sure my health is at 1 isn't too annoying to do. Patrick Stewart informed me that his time had come, the last remaining path out of the city just so happened to be through my cell, and our escape began. They went their own way and left me to fend for myself, against the armies of Ratatouille breaking down the barriers for all rat kind. I died more times than you'd think to these mice. It's also worth pointing out that I do have a few mods installed. None of them affect gameplay. They were mostly for the UI, but they were there nonetheless. After setting the difficulty down as low as it could go, I killed the rats, sent a message to an old friend, and got baby's first bow from a dead skeleton on the ground. Archery in Oblivion is a little different than it is in Skyrim, mostly because it feels more like a bow and arrow. The arrow dips towards the earth, much sooner than they do in Skyrim, so you've got to put some effort into aiming instead of just putting the crosshair on the target and pressing a button. I found it to be much more satisfying to kill creatures with a bow than it is in Skyrim. A bit deeper into the caves, I encountered a goblin for the first time. A sneak attack can take them out in one shot, but they can still be a threat if you're not careful. Overall, Getting through this introductory dungeon cave area wasn't anything crazy. It's the tutorial section, it's supposed to be easy. Before long, you'll be faced with the biggest decision of your life. Bigger than having a child. Bigger than naming the child. Bigger even than deciding what kind of coffin you want for your child. Choosing your sign. I went with Thief for 10 point bonuses to my agility, speed, and luck attributes. The Thief, from what little research I did, seemed to be one of the go-to choices for any kind of archer build. Continue through the dungeon with your impromptu friends, aggravate yourself by trying to set your health back to 1, save the Emperor from attackers with a well-placed flame hand ranged attack, obtain the amulet of kingly swag from Patrick Stewart, and press deeper into the dungeon towards the light at the end of the tunnel. But before you do that, you must choose a specialization and two favored attributes. Stealth gives bonuses to acrobatics, light armor, marksmen, Jeff's farming and mercantile supply store, security, sneak, and speechcraft. Light armor is the only one that's worthless. My favorite attributes were agility and speed for more bonuses to marksmen, acrobatics, and a few other things. My major skills were armorer, athletics, illusion, marksman, mercantile, security, and sneak. Should be pretty obvious why I chose those skills. The only possible odd man out is armorer, but that's used for repairing weapons and such. To be honest, I put way more thought into this than I needed to. You could wing it, have no idea what you're doing, and still get through oblivion without too many problems. More stealth kills and bow and arrow through the dungeon, see the light, be born into the world, and the real game begins. From here you can do anything, be anyone. I, of course, was only interested in completing the main quest, so I set off for Wynan Priory to give the Amulet of Kings to Joffrey, the only man in the capital wasteland who knows the location of Emperor Uriel Septim's last living son. If I'm being honest, which I'm not, this game looked far better than I remember it looking. I might have had a graphics mod installed, I don't remember. The next 10 minutes or so were spent running through the countryside towards my objective. Nothing worth mentioning transpired on my way there. Joffrey, surprised that I actually had the Amulet of Kings, was unsure what the Emperor meant when he mentioned the Jaws of Oblivion shortly before his death. But I've seen the title of this game. 
I knew exactly what he was talking about. Joffrey informed me of Martin, a well-to-do lad serving at the chapel in Kavach. Before leaving, I took everything he offered to me, namely a steel bow and 30 steel arrows. With another waypoint to mindlessly follow, I set off for Kavach. I was, uh, let's say, overjoyed at the way the wolves went all floppy after an arrow entered their skull and turned off their life. Some people get their jollies by wiping out 50% of all life in the universe. I'm a simple man. All it takes to put a smile on my face is a dead animal. Upon arriving in Kavach, something seemed off. Some idiot spilled red paint on the clouds. That's gonna take weeks to clean up. Somebody's gonna pay for that. Or, more accurately, some wolf is gonna get an arrow in the snout for that. A soldier outside Kivach convinced himself that if he followed his orders, everything would be fine. Never mind the fact that a literal portal to hell was open right in front of him. I admired his optimism so much that I murdered the goblins in the courtyard and entered the chapel to speak to Brother Martin. He knew the Emperor was dead, yet he did not know who he was. In time, he would learn it real good. He'd only go with me if his compatriots were safe and sound in the ground, or above it. So, I fulfilled a lifelong dream of going to heck. Meltman was there, a man who almost got melted by the eternal flames of oblivion. After sinking into the red goo to experience a beautiful death, I gave my word to Hand to Venus that I'd shut the oblivion gate and save the world. If nothing else, these Daedra guys know how to make a demonic paradise feel like home. I felt like I could really settle down here and get tortured for the rest of my life. They even had boulders the size of kidney stones roaming free. Putting aside the thrilling atmosphere, making my way to the central tower wasn't anything super difficult. These plants whacked me into unconsciousness a handful of times. The scamps can go down in one shot because I'm playing on super crybaby easy mode. Sneak attacks can make attacks do three times damage, so all but the toughest of foes can be defeated with an arrow and some effort. Also, at this point, I'd still not made the quest I was trying to complete my active quest. The menu confused me and made me miss the invisible and unreliable Pip-Boy of Fallout 3. And as much as I love wearing a propeller hat and having the game hold my hand through the entire game, it was fun just trying to figure out where to go on my own without being told where to go. Confusing at times, and I absolutely followed the quest marker as soon as I hit puberty and figured out how to make a quest an active quest, but it was an enjoyable romp through the unforgiving hellscape while it lasted. Some 25 minutes later, I made my way to the heart of hell, the sigil stone, powering the Oblivion Beltway. Being the protagonist, I ripped the giant marble from its holster, stuck it in my pocket, and informed the captain of a job well done. With the remaining Daedric forces cut off from any reinforcements, we stormed the town, vowing to cleanse it of all grotesque and horrifying creatures. With all the friendly faces on my side, it was a quick and decisive victory. Back in the chapel, two NPCs rambled on about what I can only assume are remaining Daedric militants out in the plaza with the rats. The nerve of those f to invade the Elder Scrolls IV on Michael's birthday. I will not stand for this. I will not hesitate to sacrifice the lives of the Kavachian people to stop this infestation. The Count left his old life on Sesame Street behind and joined the Elder Scroll to begin anew. He's the man with the plan, so to speak. He has a key to the gatehouse, and we need that key, I think. I played through Oblivion in mid-April, and it's May the 6th now. Without general subtitles, it was hard to remember exactly what was happening. Count Von Count was down in the basement of the temple, and luckily for me, a group of Imperial soldiers arrived just in time for me to expend their lives. Together, we battled through the more destroyed outsidey parts. These scamps made sure to eat their Flintstones vitamins before beginning their assault, and as a result, are tougher than prior enemies. Some take two whole arrows to kill. It's unprecedented. Inside a tunnel, we all continued to defeat the foes in our path on our quest to enter the gatehouse. At a distance, the scamps will use magic as their method of attack. This isn't Call of Duty. You can dodge their attacks with relative ease, or you can play with a display case like a dimwit. Any kind of close quarters encounter is going to be a problem though. It was here I began using a destruction spell on a more recurrent basis. After finding the rotting corpse of Count Von Count, I left to inform his widow of the good news. The peasants on Sesame Street will celebrate this day for generations to come. Savlian, upon hearing of how the Count was slain in battle, a lie I made up to keep spirits high, gave me his armor. I was momentarily concerned that the additional points and endurance would mess with my ability to be a limp noodle man, but it didn't. Or if it did, I didn't notice it. Good Brother Martin left the chapel 
and was hiding out in a campsite outside the city. He agreed to head to Wayne Priory. I bartered with the most beautiful NPCs to ever grace a Bethesda game. Fast traveled to the Priory, was told of Daedric Marauders invading the castle, and battled the forces of darkness in a race against time to save Joffrey. It was around this point, I noticed for the first time that fast traveling can restore your health. I'm not sure why it happens, it's just another hassle to deal with. I might have mentioned that already, I don't care enough to check. Joffrey was safe and sound, surrounded by Daedra that have been returned to their eternal slumber. Once the screaming and slaughter had died down enough, I gathered my thoughts, was told by Joffrey that the only safe place for our new leader was Cloud Ruler Temple, and we went there. I did, anyway. One neat thing about this game is that you can fast travel to several locations without having to discover them first. I took a victory lap around the temple. That's absolutely what it was. I 100% did not miss the entrance and wander around looking for it before realizing that Joffrey and Martin were still back at the Priory, at which point I went back to town, accidentally stole a horse, and got assaulted. That didn't happen. Once the gang and I reunited at the temple, Martin was crowned as emperor. He gave a speech, and we formulated a new plan. Short version is, Martin takes the Amulet of Kings to the Temple of the One to light the dragon fires. He also explained that Meru's Dagon is behind the Daedric invasion of Elder Scrolls IV. Joffrey offered me a spot as a blade, gifted me a worthless toothpick that I held onto for a while, and left for the Imperial City to track down Boris, a man Joffrey believed to know more about the invasion. Boris laid a trap for someone he believed to be nefarious. I assassinated the assassin, found a strange book on his corpse, and learned of Mythic Dawn. Oh, they have the Amulet of Kings. I probably should have mentioned that. That's the wrench in our plan, the vomit in our cereal, so to speak. After selling nonsense and buying more archery supplies, I found a lizard lady in the Arcane University. There are four Mythic Dawn commentaries I would need in total. I have one, the lizard has another, and another I obtained from a collector in a shop who didn't understand the forces he was messing with. I was sure he was a Daedric spy, but he was just a pathetic wannabe cult member. I sympathized for him. We've all gone down the cult road at some point. The fourth book would be a challenge because nobody had ever seen it. Luckily for us, Boris was being indoctrinated into the Mythic Dawn cult, and one of the cult head honchos was rumored to have the fourth book. Boris led me to the sewers, away from everyone else for a moment alone. I died to the mud crabs and assorted sewer creatures more times than I should have, used a magician's trick to light the sewers and raise the out of my illusion skill, and Boris went to talk to the cultists. I failed at being sneaky, which cost me my life. The second time, I opened fire almost immediately, got my hands on the fourth Mythic Dawn commentary, and leveled up for the first time. I chose to increase agility, speed, and personality. Agility and speed were to boost the skills I've mentioned multiple times already, and personality because it seemed like it would be the third most useful pick based on what skills it affected. Back at university, I asked the lizard to work her magic once more to scour the four commentaries for clues. I had to wait a day for any results. I'd assume the game wants you to do side missions or something while you wait for the day to pass. Obviously, I didn't do that. I waited in place, next to her, standing in place for 24 hours. Then another 24 hours because she's slow and stupid like a turtle that survived a gunshot wound to the head. But she was smart enough to figure out what Mankar Cameron's hidden message was. Mankar Cameron being the thing who wrote the four commentaries. Wait at the garden in the Imperial Palace at noon for a sign. I thought the sign was this freak standing next to me. I'm not sure what kind of weirdo would stand next to somebody for as long as he did. It was quite unnerving. But the glowing wall revealed the location of the Mythic Dawn Shrine. The location of the Amulet of Kings. I traveled to the closest location I could, Black Waterside Stables, and was back on the trail. Some minutes later, I found myself at Lake Aureus Caverns, the hideout of the Mythic Dawn. Yes, I'm aware that my health is seemingly full at the moment. I convinced the doorkeeper that I was a promising up-and-comer in the cult scene, so I could get inside without needing to attack anyone or, more importantly, be attacked by anyone. Mankar Cameron himself gave a wonderful speech before Doctor Stranging himself back to whatever dimension he calls home, along with the Amulet of Kings. My infiltration mission was for naught. However, opportunity presented itself to me a chance to get the Mysterium Zarxis, a book written by Meru's Dagon himself. The only small problem is that the Mythic Dawn do not want me to obtain that special book, or so I thought. 
I wouldn't know actually. I reloaded a save, blew my cover, and began sneak attacking my way through the cavern. I can safely say that I was too engulfed in the game to notice that my health was still not at 1. Because of the nature of this challenge, sneak attacks were crucial here, and had I taken damage somewhere, it would have been immediately apparent that I screwed something up. But that didn't happen, because I fixed it before I got too deep into the caves. The only area of note in this mass execution of demonic forces was the sacred chamber that I just teleported from in a past life. Some guy was about to be sacrificed, I snagged the special book of secrets, the statue collapsed on Sleeping Beauty. I set him free after admiring his body. He fled for his life, and I made my escape. I killed a lot of people on my way out of the cavern. In fact, I went out of my way to kill as many people as I could find. A mythic dawn guard took a fair bit of effort to kill. I followed my new best friend out of the cavern, said goodbye forever to my former best friend, and returned to Cloud Ruler Temple to deliver the book to Martin. He read my mind and knew I didn't recover the Amulet of Kings. The book is dangerous, which was why I gave it to him. His reward for me was speaking to Joffrey about spies attempting to infiltrate the temple. I killed J-E-A-R-L in self-defense after thinking that she was maybe a spy. Could have been the Daedric mace she wielded that gave it away. Could have just been a mother's intuition. We may never know. After informing Bird, captain of the Bruma Guard, about the spy, I was given permission to search Gerald's house. Never one to turn down an invitation for home invasion, I entered the house, read a document, containing orders from the enemy, and returned the document to Joffrey, so we could formulate our next move. My next move. I'm the donkey here who does all the f***ing work. There are one more spies that need to go quietly into that good night. I got bonked into submission the first time I fought the spy. The second time I got the drop on her, eliminated the threat with incredible grace, retraced my steps to get back to Cloud Ruler Temple, and Martin had a plan. I must obtain a Daedric artifact. This would be the first of many impossible tasks I was ordered to complete. But where there's a will, there's a smith. And I knew just where to get my hands on some Daedric toys. The Shrine of Azura. Mel's Mayron wouldn't give me the details on the shrine unless I persuaded him of my good intentions. The persuasion system in Oblivion is beyond my comprehension. Luckily for me, this guy's cheaper than a 10 cent whore. I paid him off, he told me to offer glow dust to the shrine at dusk or dawn, and I left to find whatever the profanity glow dust is. My gut told me it was probably some kind of dust that glows. But I had to be sure. It can be bought, like all odds and ends, in the Imperial City Market. I spent about 10 minutes in the various shops, visiting all the different merchants and seeing what they had to offer, because I care about this game world and its characters, and not because I couldn't find the main ingredient shop which sells it. Upon offering the dried up dust belonging to an elderly fairy to the shrine, a voice appeared in my ears and told me how to obtain a Daedric artifact. If I release the souls of her followers who've been trapped in a nearby Minecraft for countless ages, she would obtain me the artifact. These guys were the real deal. Most of them went down with one sneakily placed arrow, but some of them withstood being used as a glorified pincushion for my arrows taking five or six arrows to be downed. The zombie sent by one of the ghosts did me a good startle. With all the vampires dead, yes they were vampires, I didn't know that until the thing popped up on my screen, I could return to Cloud Ruler Temple again to sleep myself up to level three, pick the same attributes to improve, and be rewarded with Azura Star as a thank you at the shrine. After giving the star to Martin, Joffrey talked my head off about some mythic dawn plan to attack Bruma. Someone must think I was born yesterday, because I don't remember being told that it's actually an oblivion gate that opened up outside Bruma. I probably was told and just forgot. It's a legitimate problem. I don't remember when it started. More scamps were inside the oblivion world. Sneak attacks on them all made it a cakewalk. However, this dimension of hell introduces us to the Spitfire Towers. There are these little tower tiny pricks that spin up and blast fire towards you at the speed of light. Real annoying to get past. Being in third person helps quite a bit for this. Inside the fiery spike, no enemy ever had a chance thanks to the expendable and biodegradable companions accompanying me. The fire water in this area also kills you. Getting through the rest of this tower was trivial at worst. Rather high up in the tower, I broke about 15 locks 
trying to idiot a door open. At the tippy top of the tower, I accidentally killed a friendly, the game told me that Todd Howard saw what I did, I obtained another sigil stone, apparently teleporting back, killed a few guys, Bird understood how to close any additional gates that opened, and Joffrey begged me to ask the leaders of other cities in Cyrodiil and the Elder Council to send more men to Bruma. F*** that. Not a chance. Bruma can burn. Martin's next impossible task for me was the blood of a god. He's asking for the innards of something that doesn't actually exist. Tiber Septim's armor has his blood because hygiene means nothing in the name of religion. The sanctum holding Septim's armor is haunted, cursed, bamboozled, bazingud. It got the Bethesda treatment, whatever you want to call it, it got it. I got arrested as soon as I set foot in the Imperial City. I found that odd as I hadn't any memory of committing a crime. But I'm a good American. Even if I didn't commit the crime, I'll do the time. After getting what I went to the Imperial City for, I entered the wilderness to find the catacombs of Sankor Tor. Once there, I thought I hit a roadblock because I'm stupid. My arrows did nothing against the ghosts. Sneaking past them wasn't an option. Outrunning something without legs is frowned upon in a civilized society, so that wasn't an option either. Somewhere along the way, I figured out that fire magic can defeat the ghosts. I had enough magic juice coursing through my fingernails to kill about three ghosts back to back without needing to wait for my magic to return. The ghost of Raylus was laid to rest, but his companions were not. They too must achieve the eternal slumber before they would have the power to lift the curse from the catacombs, thus unsealing the door to the armor. I gotta kill more ghosts. Your own patience, if you're in a position like me, where you don't have a large pool of magic to draw from, or powerful enough spells to kill the transparent <laughs> in one blast, will be your undoing in these wicked corridors. Also, the spells in this game sometimes seem to track you. They don't. I know that as a probable fact, it's just that sometimes a ghost will fire in the direction you're already going, and if you're slow in the head, you won't react in time to stop moving. Then you get hit and die. All things considered, this was more time consuming than anything else. There's a lot of ground to cover, three different cursed blades you must find and relieve of their duties. It's likely that I could have just ignored the ghosts and sprinted past them, but I didn't do that. Once all four are dealt with, the enchantment, sealing the shrine to Ty Perceptum, will be dispelled and you can retrieve the armor. Because I'm familiar with how video games work, I fully expected some giant boss ghost to emerge from the stone when I picked up the armor. Didn't happen, though I did get a few action shots that I fully intended as using as the basis for a thumbnail. Oh well, that's what I get for making the thumbnail before the video script is finished. I spoke to all four ghosts, despite figuring out after talking to the second that they all said the same thing, attempted to rob another tomb, and returned to Martin while wearing the armor, hoping for some unique reaction. Then I remembered that this game was released in like 1991. I was expecting too much of it. Martin's great Short bus scavenger hunt continued with a Great Welkin Stone. Just like all the other garbage I've collected, a Great Welkin Stone is not easy to come by. In fact, there's only one known to be left, which just so happens to be located in the ruins of Miskarkand, because of course it is. You can think of Miskarkand as the Dwemer Ruins of Oblivion. It's a place where an ancient civilization lived before the Age of Man. There are also very light puzzle elements at play here. The only kind of puzzle I can tolerate is a connect the dots with two dots. Anything else, I can't do it. And to make matters worse, there are bitter fish goblins down in these ruins as well. I say, as if I have any idea what that means. All you need to know is that they're shockingly quick and deceptively dead after I'm done with them. You've gotta press buttons to activate doors and find the doors that open, and it's an ordeal and a half. In the final room lies the Great Welkin Stone in all of its great stony glory. The big spooky will be unhappy that you've taken his most prized possession. You won't care, because possession is nine-tenths of the law. He'll die faster than you'd expect for someone named the King of Miskarkand, most likely because if you're a cool cat, you'll be playing on the easiest difficulty. Then, with the third item, Martin will be ready for what comes next. What comes next is what governors of states with fewer than 10 million people have nightmares about, opening a great oblivion gate. We need one last object, a great sigil stone, to open a portal to Paradise Falls, where Mankar Cameron calls home. The Countess of Bruma was less than thrilled to learn that we wanted to rip open a giant portal to heck 
in her backyard. In the temple, I had the option of telling the Countess that we would hold off opening the gate until I gathered more allies for our cause. The problem with that is that more people lowers the likelihood that we'll all die horrendously or just get dragged into the portal to be tortured for the rest of our natural lives. I held off on the reinforcements. They don't need more reinforcements anyway. I'm all the reinforcements they need. Sean Bean gave a brilliant speech at the first portal, and wave after wave of Daedric forces were sent to defeat us as more portals began to open. Now, I know what you're thinking. My health is full, and you're right. In an open combat situation like this, it defeats the purpose of the run. I noticed that shortly after the third Oblivion Gate opened, which was why, rather than setting my health to one right then and there, I reloaded a save to before the battle began, made sure my health was at one, and did the entire thing again. The number of seconds wasted was astronomical, at least 350, if not 400. It was unprecedented in the history of Mitten Squad Oblivion No Damage Runs. Marty the Elephant gave his speech again, my health was at one, and the battle began again. This felt a lot more like a climactic final battle than anything I remembered in Skyrim. The Dramora curls and scamps just kept coming, wave after wave, increasing in intensity and number as gate after gate opened. Oddly enough, the scamps were tougher than the curls. They only took two or three arrows to kill, but landing two arrows on a moving target while you're moving and also trying to not get hit by any other flying projectile or 40 pound mace being wielded by a red maniac is no easy feat. I had my first crash as I prepared to enter the giant oblivion gate. After trying and failing to get a cinematic shot of me running towards the giant gate, I entered the plane of oblivion and I was swept away by a giant tidal wave of confusion about where to go or what to do. I meandered my way north, when all else fails, go up towards the giant mechanical demon machine. I realized my mistake, reloaded a save inside one of the towers, crossed the rainbow bridge, scaled more towers filled with Dramora people. I've been saying Daedric when maybe I should have been saying Dramora. I bet that's pretty annoying if you care about that sort of thing. With the war gate lowered, opened whatever, I continued my way through the plane of oblivion, opened a portal door to the world breaker, sneak attacked all the things, obtained the great flying ball of love and misery and pain. The giant machine was apparently in the middle of breaking into our dimension when I left their dimension. Martin told me we had all the necessary components to track down the Amulet of Kings, from Mankar Cameron, and it was time to travel to paradise. But not before stopping by the market and getting f***ing arrested again! I still have no idea what I did wrong. I was less enthusiastic about serving my sentence this time. I was so unenthusiastic about it that I forgot to put on pants after getting my clothes back. I sold what I didn't need, which was like everything, except my bow, arrows, armor that boosts stats, and ceremonial weapons that I'll never use, but will keep on my person at all times anyway. I also traveled out to the Archer's Paradox in Bravel to stock up on arrows before returning to Martin once more and entering Paradise to face Mankar Cameron. The first being I encountered was an Ascended Immortal. He called this place a nightmare, but the name of the area we're in is the Savage Gardens. There are demon dino dogs roaming the countryside looking for tasty mortals to feast on. The only thing working to their advantage is their speed. They're not particularly tough. After killing Cathetet and not speaking to him, I obtained the Bands of the Chosen and entered the Flooded Grotto to see what else Cameron had in store for me. The Flooded Grotto was cool, but the Forbidden Grotto is where it's at. Nothing better than the screams of people stuck in lava without being able to die. I, of course, had to join him to see if it was as fun as it looked. Expecting everything to be a threat, I attacked from the farthest possible distance at all times. A fair bit into the Forbidden Grotto, I paused the challenge to see if the boots I'd found that let me walk on water worked on fire water, which they did. It wasn't much longer after that that I arrived at the door to paradise, the ultimate blockage. My understanding of what was happening here was that I cannot, under any circumstances, enter paradise while wearing the bands of the chosen, and I cannot take off the bands of the chosen. Even with God mode enabled as a funny haha, I got a message popping up on the screen basically telling me that I can't open the door, and then I'm blasted in the face with some green magic. I was sure I'd reached an insurmountable impasse, a fork in the road that stabs me in the eye before I can make any decision. Then, 
my knight in shining armor appeared before me in my hour of need, Eldamil, an Atmer crybaby who led the Daedric army at the Battle of Kavach. He freed me from my wretched existence by removing the bands of the Chosen, allowing me to enter paradise proper, be led to Karak Agalor by Ruma Cameron, and confront Mentor Cameron at last. I got whacked almost immediately by one of his guards, retreated after loading my last save, took out Mankar Cameron with two well-placed arrows, took all his virtual possessions, was teleported back to Cloud Ruler Temple, and gave Martin Septim the Amulet of Kings, after I tried to wear it. After countless battles, the end is in sight. The Oblivion Crisis can be finished once and for all if Emperor Martin Septim relights the dragon fires in the capital city. Thankfully, I wasn't arrested this time. High Chancellor Arcado confessed that the man I saw earlier in the Imperial City wasn't actually Shrek, and Meru's Dagon made one last ditch attempt to stop us. He sent his toughest minions to kill us all. But rules is rules, and they're not allowed on the table. Mom said so. They couldn't reach me up there, except for when they could. Outside, things were not good. More Dramora than you can wrap your pathetic singular mind around. In the Temple District, the unthinkable happened. We got endgamed. It was too late. Mehrun's Dagon arrived in Tamriel, and the laws of our universe dictate that he cannot be destroyed here. But if there's one thing Sean Bean knows how to do, it's die. He had a plan, and the full might of whatever remained of the Imperial Legion rallied behind Martin and I as all of us together pushed through the final stage in the Oblivion invasion towards the Temple of the One. Inside the temple, Martin revealed the details of his plan. As Mehrun's Dagon laid waste to the temple, Martin used his royal blood and the Amulet of Kings to turn himself into a giant, golden, fire-breathing parrot. The two engaged in a titanic slugfest for the fate of Tamriel. Ultimately, after being showered in holy fire, Mehrun's Dagon fell before Emperor Martin Septim, who turned to stone upon defeating the Daedric Prince of Oblivion. The final cutscene rolled, and I'm pretty sure I beat the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion without taking any damage. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server through a link in the video description. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.